Rum was the first DJ in the city to really start playing backwards music. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's right. Which, which that's caught right. up real big in Chicago for a minute. And it was truly a Rod Hardy trait. Physically, physically yes. play it backwards. One trick that yeah. he used to use though, the upside with down. The, you take a thimble, oh, right. a, a thimble, and you put it on the turntable, and you put the record up down flat on top of the flip thimble, the shell upside and flip down. your head shell, and, play inside oh, out. and the record here. plays inside. Flip it over like this, to flip it around like this. This is what I did. Take the weight of the record, all the weight of the needle, all the way down. Where it floated. But see, it would be able to right. stay on. It would be able to stay. He would have a way it would stay. And it would play backwards. It would play backwards. Yeah. Z -z 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 on beat. The original music box was located in Mexico, New Mexico, Albuquerque. So I used to fly back and forth. So there were two clubs jointly together, and that was a studio, <coughs> excuse me, and the music box. So after Frank decided to open a power plant, I decided, well, he's, I didn't have a DJ anymore actually either, because he was doing the, the power plant. So, a friend of mine canvassed Ron Hardy and asked him would he come in with us and do the warehouse, and he didn't want to do that. So we decided, well, we'll give you your own club. What about the music box? So I opened the music box here as a foreign corporation. So that's how it became an existence here in Chicago. I closed it down in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and brought it corporately here to Illinois, to Chicago, as a foreign corporation. And that's where we began with Ron Hardy. At first, it wasn't too good because, remember now, the warehouse had a monopoly on after-hour clubs. <laughs> sort of like Paradise Garage during its heyday. You know, nothing compared with that, so, you know, no one, you know, it was no competitive thing for the Paradise Garage. But, uh, so we had to re, I had to reinvent the whole after hour scene kind of thing for the music box and give it a different type of um, plan and structure for it to work and even maybe say compete a little with the power plant. So they became slightly competitive. Their night was what, Friday and Saturday or just Saturday? Friday and Saturday. Those big, those two big nights. Right. So when the music box came, it had to compete for one of those nights. Right. Well, no, because remember now, we're talking about the ownership of the warehouse, which was me. 
So I wasn't going to compete for a night. I always did Saturday night, so I was consistent with what I wanted to do. So I did Saturday night for the music box. So after changing the format, the after hour format for the music box, I gave a big free party and invited everyone. 85% of the people, or 75% of the people who attended the music box were heterosexuals. 95% or 85% of the people who attended the power plant were homosexuals. So it lent to a different type of party scene. Now, the people who attended the power plant, the gay people, they were accustomed to the natural scene anyway. The heterosexual guys and girls, they, it was something new to them. So it was a, new, a different market and music scene for them. It was a new birth of music for them. So they had gone bananas completely over this newfound love, which created a real music cult because they became much wilder in their partying situation. Nights at the power plant people wore on Friday night, people tend to wore nice little turtlenecks, dress slacks maybe, silk shirts, a sweatshirt. At the music box, they wore cut-off jeans, sweatshirts, sweatpants. When people came to the music box, they came specifically for one reason, to get their jack on. They came there to sweat and listen to music. I mean, they sweated. I'm not, I don't want you to think they didn't sweat and have a good time at the power plant, which they did. But it wasn't quite as intense. Yeah, you came out of the music box like you had been through a ringer. You know, like if you went in looking decent, you came out looking almost homeless <laughs> because you had just overexhausted yourself and, you know, just like, what the hell, what the hell has happened here? Moreover, like they did at David Mancuso's. Now, we must be aware that these are two uh, similar corporations, kind of like, in a sense, because the warehouse and the music box are really under the same governing situation. So we already had an enormous mailing list, okay? And uh, the people who followed Frankie to the power plant were the same people, in a sense. I mean, they didn't really have, you know, the mailing list thing, but, you know, it was the only club, so they knew where he was going to be at, you know, after canvassing and um, promoting through the city, you know, for his opening. So when I changed the uh, warehouse to the music box, we just sent out invitations to our vast number of warehouse members, making them aware that there was a new club, which was the Music Box, and a new DJ, which was Ron Hardy. And they had never really heard Ron. Some people had, because he played at this little club here in Chicago, sort of like, um, it was called The Ritz. The people who attended The Ritz were familiar with Ron. And the you know, after hour heads, they weren't quite that familiar with him. But free always works. You know, when you look at your wallet and you say, well, well, hell, I don't have to pay anything for this party on Saturday. I'll go to the, so we are going to negotiate it like this. So the people are the ones that really, I think, changed it. Because they went to the power plant on Friday and paid their money to go to power plant on Friday and they went out again on Saturday to the music box which was free so they didn't have to pay anything to go to the music box 
And why should they pay to go to the power plant again the following night? You know, yes, he was upset, you know. But, you know, because he was, it was one of his first business ventures, you know. Yeah, he was a little ticked, I should say, a little. But, you know, it was healthy. And then on the other hand, here's two childhood friends doing this now. You know, Mr. Knuckles and Mr. Williams, you know. So, kind of knowing each other. So at some point, we had to compromise about things, you know, because now it was like this to me. One was a businessman, which was Robert Williams, myself, and the other was an artist. <laughs>